So the book takes place in the near future, uh, and there's this AI coder in New York City, and she, is, she just lost her mother, and she's translating a text from the 1990s. So I'm just going to read from the, the translated manuscript, the beginning. We were 18 the summer of the drought. The cow's milk tasted of water, and the harvest had shriveled to half-formed things. Onions the size of chicken eggs were pulled from the ground, and lentils the color of the sky, the same bright blue as the dye from the garment factory. At St. Mary's Hostel, we survived off boiled peanuts and rice porridge. The single meal was meant to last us the whole day. The hunger was a lesson in the human body. And on our first day of anatomy class, we all looked drained and hollowed out, like the skeleton hanging in the front of the room. 17 girl specimens. Alone for the first time in our lives, we walked from the hostel to the canteen, our backs hunched and arms tight across our chests. And the older girls would look at us wordlessly while passing, their gaze like the steady surface of a mirror. We'd feel them willing us to look, step closer, reveal what we did not even know of our true natures. Sitting side by side, the older girls ate the patients we had yet to fully understand. They chewed on a single peanut for 20 minutes, moving their mouths so slowly as though they were, ch as though they were chanting. Sometimes they left, left their porridge outside the gates for a street dog, or they searched for the hungry before sundown, walking barefoot down the streets. To us, it seemed like they survived eating nothing at all. We had come from all different villages and cities across the state to the recently established medical college, only 29 kilometers from the island. Our parents were told we would get first-rate medical training because of the geography. How many first-year students were able to operate on patients? Our parents knew of the Civil War on the island, but with a distant recollection, much like their memory of the old epic poetry we shared, written in the same tongue when ancient kings ruled the land and nothing as elemental as water divided dynasties. For them, these were like fables, old wives' tales, useless musings that brought only more hunger. We were mostly average students who scored high enough to enter medical school, but not enough for a government scholarship. With the opening of the medical college by the refugee camps, our parents prayed at the temple, the mosque, the church, thanking the Lord for the misfortune of others. As long as people suffered, we would be employed. When they spoke of the refugees, they expressed an oversaturated pity. Their voices clotted with satisfaction. And before they could turn away, we saw the faint outline of a smile crossing their lips as if they found a dark edged pleasure in the image of us holding knives and needles, poking and prodding with our young and experienced hands. So maybe I should like preface that a little bit. So that was, uh, so that was the beginning of a manuscript and it's about a kind of, the manuscript takes place on the nineties and it's about a kind of a group of female medical students and they're living at the kind of, uh, at the edge of a war and also a drought. Um, and it's geography, I never specify where it is but sort of kind of like at the edge between like kind of India and Sri Lanka. Um, thank you for, for reading um, and for, for that particular section. Um, since the idea of translation is something that, that is sort of essential um, and keeps coming back throughout the book. Um, but I wanted to go, when Nikhil first mentioned and started describing the book to me was before it had been published and she described the, the sort of AI and the translation. And I was like, wow, that is just, that's a lot of ambition, a lot of different things going on. And then I read the book and I was just like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And then I read the book again now and preparing for this and seeing where we are now with language and AI, part of me was just like, oh my God, <laughs> this book is, is, is so remarkably prophetic. There's um, early in the same, or, or earlier than that section, you have, um, did you really need to learn to communicate with people in another language when you were training an algorithm to comprehend all permutations of sound? Um, and I was thinking of, of just how you how you first began to think of and imagine um, both this sort of near future world, but then also the relationship of this AI to language, especially since like right now with, I'm sure many of you have been inundated with this chat GPT uh, anxiety and crisis, which is sort of probably looming over all of us, but like how that, it seemed so prescient that you were already kind of thinking about that. Yeah, 
Yeah, I know. I, some people have mentioned after like, you know, Chat GPT came out in November, they were like, oh, this feels very familiar to like your book in the sense that the, the main character is working on this project, this AI project, and it kind of has this, uh, and it's in natural language development. And it's, and it, like the, the AI is doing things kind of unusually in, this, in some ways, kind of like Chat GPT doing things that seems almost kind of the, has its own kind of consciousness that's moving toward that. Um, yes, yeah, so I was kind of thinking about kind of language itself. So there's like coding that's happening, like coding as a language uh, in training the AI and also thinking of coding, I mean, thinking of language in sense of translation. Um, so in like sense, it, it might seem sort of like strange, like, like AI and translation. Uh, but I think I was trying to put like kind of like high technology and kind of this low technology or just thinking of like translation of that act in kind of conversation together. Um, and the fact that, you know, this takes place in the near future that has like this kind of futuristic edge for at the same time it's in the 90s. And there's a lot of artifacts like old artifacts are in the book. So there's also like there's like the mother is collecting archives of things and there's like phonographs and there's different things. So I kind of wanted to just put like kind of all of kind of technology and I kind of in the sort of space together collectively. Um, and I think like AI specifically, uh, uh, in I was interested in kind of thinking about how do we talk about it in a way that fe also feels sort of kind of futuristic, but also grounded in what is happening now too. So there's not necessarily like, you know, um, there's not, it's not like super, it's not humanoids. It's not humanoids, but it's sort of like kind of like narrow AI, but taking a little step further from what we have now, which is kind of like a chat GPT is also seems like that direction too. You also, you, 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 you do, you, you bring all of these wonderful sources of tension together in the story, right? Where there's mm -hmm. that sense of both this like near future that seems very familiar and yet at the same time has just enough of a kind of distortion where it's not our reality. Um, but then all of these artifacts from our, our very near past, which are or our present in some cases, that we can also easily sort of grasp onto. And these two aren't just side by side, they're almost kind of actively mm -hmm. competing for each other's, for both our attention, but also I think to, in, without making it too good, almost for like our humanity, mm -hmm. right? And that sense of what, how that plays out with language. There's Another note where you have, um, we are not individuals, but behavior patterns. What if using a, cer a certain temperature of water makes your skin cells shrivel up and age more quickly? Um, and that made me think, well, what's the, what is the difference, right, between the individual and the behavior pattern? And how does this story try to kind of find the individuals, um, even as they're trying, even as almost being kind of erased by the, this sort of technology? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point because you know, uh, and, you know, you brought that quote about you know we are all just kind of behavior patterns. So it's kind of very interested in thinking about like, all this data that we're constantly shedding, and that's like the, the data is the material that like AI is trained on. So thinking about how like you know we are all these kind of like little like we're kind of always constantly shedding data and even just interacting with the world in the social media, we're just like, you know giving up all this data. So how is it being kind of fed through kind of this AI machinery and how kind of like we are also. Um, uh, you know, AI is seen, it seems like, you know, it seems like they're kind of like this unbiased kind of these outer things, these kind of uh, entities, but it's kind of, it's, it's like us, it's like yeah. kind of a collective consciousness is being fed through this. And it just kind of amplifies our, like our own beliefs, our own kind of, even our own biases and everything. Um, so kind of seeing that through like this data in that sense, um, and also thinking about like the, the, yeah, and then, you know, in the manuscript itself, they are also the, they're, these women are kind of, uh, they're going to medical school and they're kind of thinking of this new way of kind of like, how can we kind of really help people around us? And they come up with this idea, kind of like this idea of kind of radical compassion. So yeah, thinking about how do we, how do you become like humane in the kind of the digital world? What does the radical compassion even look like? Um, in the kind of AI centric world, uh, in the in the in 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 this futuristic world, there's also this kind of carbon square monitoring where there's con they're constantly kind of recording your data. So, um, what does it mean to like uh, to be a kind of humane in the digital world? I think that's yeah. kind of a question it's asking. And there's there's interesting there's there's sort of two forms of labor happening, right? Mm -hmm. There's the narrator who's feeding all of this information into this AI machine, which is. Um, growing smarter and stranger as that processes that information. And yet there's the other half of the of the narrative's labor, which is the translation, yeah. um, which is its own type of, and it's a similar type of discourse, right? But a different type of work. One involves inputting this thing. The other one requires something else. I mean, yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, that, that interesting divide between 
the, how that narr- how the narrator's kind of conscious is almost split in half yeah. between these two acts. Yeah, that's a good point because it's like these two like two acts of labor that are happening, and there's one a specific that you know this feeding into the machinery into training this AI model, uh, and it's uh, and it's also for a specific purpose. Like you know, this is a kind of a job in this kind of like in this sort of in her workplace. So this kind of like, into this capitalistic machinery that it has like a true purpose, versus this like translation, which also doesn't necessarily have a, a clear purpose in the sense that, you know, uh, maybe someone will publish it like for like nothing, uh, for no like really compensation. But uh, in the sense, like there's like this kind of deep act of intimacy, I guess, in both things, but especially in thinking about translation, because in this, some ways, in, like instead of feeding a machinery, she is like feeding the words into herself. And then she will have to kind of feed, like she's taking language and also like putting it back out in, in another form. Um, so I was really interested in kind of the act of also translation is also in both cases, it's kind of like for the AI, it's also a kind of resurrection, like you're making this thing, this AI machinery come alive in some ways, and even translation, you're also making, so like you're also bringing back this thing that might be dead into another language, this kind of forgot, forgotten manuscript. So in some ways, she's met like resurrecting this group of girls from like yeah. obscurity. So both of them are kind of this kind of Frankensteinian thing, like bringing these two things alive again. Yeah, th- th- there's a, a, a quote we have, to translate means to carry over, to move from one place to another. In your solitude, you find yourself picking up each foreign word like a stone you might use to make a path back home. Um, there's a, a sort of wonderful sort of evocations of of just what that act and labor actually looks like. And one of the things I found really interesting is that within the act of translation, there's always some question of the kind of fallibility of the translator, right? There's this like human imperature, which can't ever be erased. And I'm wondering if you see that different from what we imagine to be the the sort of technological relationship to language, right? Which is where you're actually kind of totally effacing the human. You're you're effacing the human in order to arrive at something that might be sort of simpler, more pure, or or if, as you say, that's actually not possible, right? That we only imagine, but in fact, the 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 artificial is still just as flawed mm-hmm. as the translator's work. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Just because like, in both ways, they are, are they're both flawed. Because like, even when you think of AI, like the data you're fe- feeding the machinery, it's a specific data set, so that's going to be flawed. You know, they have a lot of examples of like. Um, uh, like facial recognition, not you know only recognizing certain colors, certain colors, certain people's yeah. faces, um, and certain racial faces. So, I think thinking about uh, yeah, so the, what what you feed into the machinery is going like, to dictate sort of like how it's going to see the world. So that and that's why it's going to be flawed in that sense. And even for the manuscript, it's going to you know uh, it's only there's like uh, in the act of translation, you're going to be missing something. Something will be lost in this act, uh, which doesn't mean uh, which is not like this awful thing, but it also means this is not not necessarily there's like a shadow book that's not there's like a shadow yeah. of like of what the book was uh and we are only getting a sense of something yeah. and um so i think in both those both those spaces kind of navigating these are both like imperfect things and then what does that mean uh and also i think i was trying to maybe even think about like how do you show the process of making something like the process like you know uh, of writing something uh uh, I think when you get the final product of a work, it's just, you know, we don't get, to, you, don't, you don't really get to see the inside process. So in this way, uh, in seeing the translator as she is translating, you get a little bit of like, like uh, her thought process and like as she's writing it. Yeah, but there's it's something I think we, t- we talked about before yeah. is that you actually see traces of the work inside of it, right? Rather than imagining that you end up with a book as the sort of finished perfect commodity, that instead you actually end up with a narrative where you see the labor of the of the translator and of the author to some degree kind of yeah. transforming that text and that's an interesting kind of presence there mm-hmm. um so I was wondering if you, if you could talk about about this because you you, you the story is narrated in a very interesting way where you use two sort of very distinct narrative perspectives a kind of a second person and then that first person plural and and why those choices right because there is I keep wanting to imagine that there is one narrator who's telling all of this but we don't actually see that narrator in that kind of yeah you know in that first person way yeah it's um yeah you know it is a really strange choice to have a second person narration and the first person plural narration and um I think the second person narration specifically um I chose that because it kind of you know inhabits that liminal space where you like you know, this this character has just kind of uh, her mother has just passed away so I think grief makes you feel like in this sort of suspended space and also disembodied. 
uh, the second person has a dis disembodying feel. You, you do feel like um, you do feel like as as the reader that you could also step into a second person as well. So it gives more space. Um, and also, I think I was trying to think of how to get the reader more entangled uh, into the book uh, in thinking about even this idea of radical compassion. How do you kind of make things feel more porous? So like both the we and the second person feels like, you know, you could also be part of this thing. Um, uh, yeah, so in, in that way, I was thinking about those two, those two, those, you know, those two point of views and also thinking about the, the collective and this kind of collective consciousness and how to kind of evoke that. Um, what was that earlier question? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but within that collective, yeah. because the, the, the text that the narrator is translating yeah. um, isn't only an act of translation, but it's also a text that's being trans that was that has a collective voice. Yeah, yeah. So rather than the idea of the kind of single authorial voice, like I'm translating Dickens, um, instead it's the translation of the chorus in a certain way. Um, if you could talk about that, like, is that was really struck by that, by that, by that sort of choral performance that happens with the we, but yet within that we, you still have these individual girls whose distinct characteristics and traits and desires all come through. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of think of like how to uh, um, how to evoke something that feels like kind of larger than like this individual. I also, I think, on an individual sense, I I think I tried writing things in the first person, and I just like somehow I uh, I think like with the book and with some of the ideas, just didn't kind of uh, the like uh, uh, it didn't resonate because a lot of the the inner manuscript is about the kind of like uh, surpassing your ego, going beyond your consciousness in some ways. So I think. Um, the we helped kind of think of something that's like larger than yourself, which also kind of feels like the, the kind of a huge data stream, like this huge thing, this massive thing that like there's an individual, but like you like you maybe you're a pixel dot in that and you can't fully see that. So in that way, uh, the manuscript kind of want, I want to have the feel kind of mythic with the we uh, at the same time, a uh, few individuals do do. I do name some certain people. Um, so I was thinking about how do we have, you know, especially with different movements or different kinds of movements, like, so they start creating this kind of idea about radical compassion and how these sort of visions sort of fall apart. So I want, kind of wanted to see how you, how uh, kind of like a movement or some sort of a, a group of individuals create something together and then how that also kind of, they, you know, it, it splits, there's different kinds of forms of this sort of ideology. Um, so just seeing this collective and also seeing it break down too. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that idea of radical compassion that the sort of girls espouse and where, like, what informs the making of that? Yeah, I guess, you know, I was just thinking, like, um, on some level about, like, what is the kind of, uh, the kind of border between caring for other people? Where is that sort of, like, where does it kind of cross into some sort of delirium even? Like, uh, and how do you, how do you actually become, like, porous to someone else's pain? What does that actually mean? Or what does that look like? Um, because there's a, this is something about compassion that can also turn into something kind of even, like, kind of dark, something that could be, like, you know, also self-destructive. Uh, I think an example that, um often give is just like you know if someone jumps and like on the on the tracks of the of the, the subway or the metro and then someone jumps and tries to save them then um uh, and if they rescue them people are like oh you're so brave for jumping in and saving this person you're so compassionate but if the person dies then people are, might say you're crazy like why did you jump in <laughs> why did you do that so it's sort of i think um like all the characters are kind of wrestling with that border, like how to really help others, like even the AI coder, like what does it mean to open yourself to other people, like care about others and how, like what, where, where is that edge? The edge, to, yeah. Did you see something similar in that, in that, you know, the, this idea of radical compassion that these girls have, it, it, it is almost like this getting to this higher, more sort of enlightened state. Um, which to me, you know, different from how we imagine technology, but yet at the same time, very parallel, like, like we imagine that we can use technology to sort of progress into a sort of a higher level type mm -hmm. of discourse, right? Um, but yet at the same time, even though one espouses a kind of purity of emotion and desire, they both have a dark side to them, yeah. right? But, um, but one doesn't, one seems sort of inherently like, ah, dystopian, whereas the other one seems almost utopian, if, yeah. initially at least, but leads to a similar... Yeah. Like, yeah. 
yeah I, I at first yeah I, that's that's very true I didn't think about it like that at all now but yeah because it does because even like for like but you know even in some ways AI it's considered you know I think sometimes like people you know if you have to choose a human or some an, an AI entity to to decide something maybe you would choose the AI initially because there's something about it that feels very unbiased that feels very like uh um that it doesn't seem flawed like a human um but you know like you know it it does and it does glitch and those kind of glitches kind of show its kind of true nature of what it's doing uh um so yeah so these things that so I think I'm also was kind of interested in uh kind of like um because in if you look at the lots of movements lots of things that happen there's kind, there's kind of like this idealistic vision and how do you kind of um kind of kind of honor the fact that they imagine some other world that the, the fact that you even imagine something even if it doesn't come to pass but that just to honor that kind of idea of imagination for some sort of vision for something else and how that act itself is some sort of radical act, even if it doesn't come to pass or it doesn't like, you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't persist or it's not long lasting. Were there any extra sort of, were there, were you thinking of any sort of actual political movements or sort of, yeah, in, in, in imagining this one? Um, I guess, you know, I think just thinking about just, you know, thinking about, like, uh, I, I guess, historically, but even thinking about like people who, who do write, who did write science fiction and different things and kind of imagining other worlds. Like, I think, you know, you, you mentioned the Du Bois thing earlier, when you mentioned <laughs> sci-fi Du Bois, but he wrote this, as, he wrote this story, short story called The Comet. Did he read? Yeah, yeah. Well, we talked about, we talked about that. Yeah, we talked about The Comet, yeah. So just different things, you know, you imagine this kind of like radically different world uh and how like it's kind of it gives you that kind of utopia of this possibility and then uh and it, it doesn't come to pass but it kind of moves the imagination a little bit mm -hmm. into imagining that and that's i think that's the case for like any, any lot of movements it's just it's kind of like a continual thing but it takes just like the act of imagining um i think also i have like like a like random quotes in the book itself so like even like grace lee boggs and different people so i think in itself it's sort of trying to grapple with those those sort of individuals too yeah. The, um, one of the things we, we've talked about before is the the kind of interesting sort of lines and sort of literary categories that this sort of yeah. book can kind of occupy, right? Where it's, um, you talk about it's not science fiction, certainly not dystopian. Um, it's very, and it's always like, well, what do you mean by it? You say it's very literary. Um, but I, I actually want to ask, like, how do you, how do you, <laughs> how, do you describe <laughs> how do you describe it? Um yeah. Actually, and, and, yeah, and how are you thinking of how, how are you thinking of the different sort of um, sort of forms that the book can be in conversation with? Yeah, no, that's a good question because I feel like it's a very difficult. Sometimes I, I think I even try and describe the book to you. I was like, it was this book. It's like futuristic <laughs> and AI and translation. Um, I think it is kind of crossing different. I do think it's still very like literary in the sense of thinking of language, but also. Uh, I do see it kind of using the kind of the metaphors of science fiction, using this kind of language of science fiction and um, using that to speak about the present moment. So I do think of the kind of conversation with other books, like even thinking of like Butler and just, but also like even, um, even thinking of like different historical texts. Uh, and I think just see seeing people who have constantly been blending genres throughout uh, in their, in their work. Um, and it, it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like anything particularly, um, I don't know, uh, like new per se, because you know when you go into like you know, like archives, you just see a lot of people doing things. I just feel very you're like, oh, this is not uh, strange. But I think people want to fit it somewhere. So I think some people have called it a dystopia, uh, like this dystopian novel. And it, it you know it is talking about this near future. Uh, at the same time, it's like it's just a kind of like it's still like our much like our present, but it feels a little bit advanced. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it's like I think there are our tendency is to try to fit it to something or yeah, some space. Yeah. But what, what what always kept it um, what what sort of made me kind of not concerned about whatever those categories might be it was actually just that that and you mentioned this earlier about the narrator or not the narrator but her uh, the narrative's consciousness um, and her position in the story right which is one of like profound kind of grief and there's this. Sort of, like really elegant and very beautifully understated kind of melancholy that um that both is the you and the second person voice but that also bleeds into the way that the translation i mean it's there in the translation because that same voice that sort of you know longing and sort of in this sort of state where they do feel outside both of themselves and the world around them 
is also kind of somehow, and I feel like that tone is actually kind of infecting the translation. You know, there's that melancholic sort of tenderness um, that feels totally at home anywhere. You know, it doesn't matter what year or what sort of dystopic or futuristic or non-futuristic thing might be happening. That thing felt like just so permanent, you know? Yeah, I think so. I think that the grief is something that is kind of, it, it, it does the kind of um, suffuse like, like the entire book in some ways. And I think that was um, figuring out how to kind of navigate the grief in a way that also felt like uh, figuring out the tone of the book, both like, uh, it, you know, there is grief, but also uh, there's a sort of like lightness in it, especially in like thinking about the outer narrative. Because uh, like, you know, even grief also feels very absurd and strange. Uh, so the book, you know, as you say, like it's, it, it is dealing very much with kind of thinking of even debt. How do we care about other people? Um, and also, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you care for others when you're also suffering? And like, I think that questions in both narratives, because these, you know, these young women in the, in the, in the manuscript, they're, you know, they're, all these refugees are coming to their shore at the same time, they're living through a drought and they're suffering. And then the AI coder is dealing with her, the loss of her mother, and also was asked to asked to kind of care for other people, thing you know, even algorithms, do different things. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, in the undercurrent, the whole book was this kind of emotional. The core of it was this kind of uh, this kind of grief and this kind of melancholy. And this character, in some ways, was holding on to this narrative, uh, the manuscript, and also. Uh, uh, even even doing this AI project as a kind of way out of the grief in some ways. Um, and I think grief just makes you do unusual things too. It's just grief is a very weird thing because it kind of cracks open reality in a way. And like suddenly you see things in a very strange way. So um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to kind of embody that kind of strangeness of yeah. it. And, and, and because that, that you know, and, and I, because the, the, the book, it doesn't like you, you're not wallowing in it, right? It's actually held at a distance. The, the narrator is sort of like that, that, loss is is controlled and restrained and so it's never if anything you're trying to get the narrator to kind of you know access it or, or reminds me of um you know remains of the day with Ishiguro where the um that butler's voice is so full of restraint until like the very end you hear the that little note of heartbreak um but in that you know there's the grief that she feels also for the loss of the her mother but it felt like there's also something else, which was a kind of lost world, right, without making it sort of, but that there is these artifacts from a very near past that are sort of littered all over this apartment that are picked up and held, tape decks, teacups, um, you know, something about a world that's no longer, that's been kind of irrevocably changed by this, uh, you know, and again, I think the idea of the new future, because it feels like so sudden, actually, that like, there was this world that was familiar to us now, and then something happened, and suddenly it's this one. And the that loss is both that intimate loss of the mother, but also something cultural, social, political. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you, the, the, they just feel like there's like multiple like lost worlds in this book. And like, you know, you mentioned the kind of like there's like, so the mother has kind of this archive of things in the house. And like there are archives, like, you know, like even like, you know, old televisions, like phonographs. And it's, it feels like both like, uh, uh, and you know, this, this collection of things is both this, these things that she kind of imbues with meaning, meaning like, oh, this belongs to someone really famous and like kind of creates a history around it. Or, you know, uh, someone else might say she's just a hoarder. She just has so many things. And this is just like, cr like a crazy mess of history. Um, but there's something kind of fascinating. I always found about like, kind of the collectors of, you know, things that even that kind of border between what's a hoarder and someone who's kind of visionary. Um, and, and for this, you know, you know, thinking about like uh, having an archive of things from like even like the, our near past, it feels also like it's some, some really strange, like, you know, that we lost some like this other world that used to exist and like you're kind of navigating it. Um, and even the manuscript also feels like kind of a lost world. Um, and then like, you know, when you're in the near future, it also, you know, it makes you kind of maybe reflect on our own world that is slowly going to, that's slowly changing or, or like that we're constantly losing something. Yeah. The, um, I, I was I was reading um, at the same time I was rereading this. The many of you might be familiar with Walter Benjamin's Arcade Project, um, and there's a great sort of line in the intro to the Arcades Project where Benjamin is going through the passages in in Paris and looking at all these objects and artifacts, um, or actually imagining actually how they were looked at. And it's um, it says the um, Benjamin central term is the dialectical image for the historical object of interpretation that which under the divinatory gaze of the collector is taken up into the collector's own particular time and place, 
and thereby throwing a pointed light on what has been. Um, and it seemed like, I mean, I was like struck by by that, that's the sort of striking similarity because there are actually sort of moments when the narrator is like picking up objects and picking up tapes for that our mother sort of left behind. And there's that sense of dissonance, right? Because here's something that actually has no functional value in this world anymore. Um, and yet that seems to be part of the reason why it has to be held, right? Like the reason for picking it up is precisely because it's lost its meaning. And that meaning says something not only about the object, but about where we are, you know? Okay, yeah, you know, yeah, because like there's no really any purpose to hold on to these items, and then uh, even in some ways, like the ephemera of someone, of someone's life, yeah. you know, like like the, what they have had, it's like it really has no meaning, maybe except to you for for some for some way, you know, maybe sentimental or for something. But yeah, it's like all these pieces, even like old technology, in some ways, no no purpose per se in the ways in a practical way. Uh, but it it is you you are you are you are creating certain sort, of, sort of archives, some sort of world, and it's. Yeah. A, and I mean, that word archive comes up repeatedly, right? Because it's one of the things that sort of deeply at stake in the story is like, actually, how do we hold on to things? Like, how do we hold on to to our both intimate personal memories? Um, and there, and how does that really, because, you know, then there's the, um, the sort of technology of memory that's actually kind of at play in the story where it's like, can there be a drug that actually contains or holds our memories for us? Yeah, so I think like approaching memory and like kind of a different kind of angle. So we have like, the ephemera of someone's life, the, those things, and then there's actually this drug that you mentioned, where like you know thinking about like oh, um, can we kind of hold you know physically kind of hold on to memories and what is kind of really tangible and what do we really have of somebody? Um, so finding different forms, like even the fact of trying to translate a manuscript is also trying to save it, trying to hold on to something uh, from it going into like. Um, obscurity so like uh how much of like this world can you hold on to and this sense of the archive is also the sense of the kind of like salvation like you're trying to like salvage like anything everything you can uh and also this question of like what gets saved too because archives is specifically um uh it's you know it's what's deemed important and so like uh what what you know uh who is deemed important in like different periods there's a lot that's not been saved right so there's a lot of absences in archives and lots of blank spots in archives um so kind of thinking about the absences in archives and also thinking about how, you know, uh, the, you know, these characters are also making archives that like maybe no one would be interested in per se. And what does that mean? Uh, like what, what kind of like what, what, what does it say about the worth of an archive and the worth, you know, um, and how we and how we save things and is anything can, can can you save anything in some ways yeah. when we're thinking about data it feels like yes it's like, there's a lot of parts of us that are saved somewhere like whatever like things and uh maybe that we wouldn't want saved yeah but, but it's also striking I'm, I'm just suddenly realizing that part of what what's also saved you know in the sort of there's the objects that we try to maybe want to hold on to and then there's all the things that's kind of data can you know breaks us down into these composite parts of gestures and behaviors and all of that stored somewhere. Um, but part of what you also seem to know is that like one of the things that actually gets stored is actually all of the <laughs> all of the biases and prejudices and sort of things that that actually is a part of that package, right? So that's going to get stored along with it as well. So I guess I'm wondering like, you know, what's the, you know, the relationship that we should have to the, to that nostalgia or to that past, right? Because it also means retaining you know, ideas and beliefs and systems of power that perhaps we would like to move away from. But if we're going to, you know, hold on to some, like, how do we separate, you know, how do we curate the past, I guess, in a way? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I think that's like a big question, right? Because it's like, how do we, uh, specific data, it just feels like this sort of like a like fingerprint of like who, like who we are now. Like, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, I, I think that also goes to in thinking about tr how do we train models? How do we train AI models? Like, what's the data set? What, what are we using? Uh, so I think that's like a question, like, how do you curate data for those biases and for those things? Uh, but as I mentioned for the archive too, it's like, it's full of all our biases because you know, what we, what we have not saved is also tells us about like, you know, our consciousness at that point. Um, so I think it's all those whole the absences in the archive are saying a lot too. Um, so, you know, in some ways, like, you know, can any, you know, uh, the archive will, you know, these things will just be like, will be a kind of fingerprint of the moment. Do you think, do you think there is a way to like, how, how do we create it? Asking you, Denise. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I, I've, I've never thought of this thing until like, <laughs> the, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, because I was talking. I was in I was in Pittsburgh, and I was talking to um, 
this woman, the director of like the Smithsonian for technology, and she and she was she they collect archives, and they're constantly you're constantly kind of just making that you're kind of deciding what you think is what should be saved. You're just so just in some ways it's like a handful of people kind of deciding in some ways certain archives and thinking about like what what which what do we need for the future? So maybe the kind of expanding that kind of narrative, but also now that people can uh, people are creating so much of their own archives and kind of oral stories, it feels like there's a plethora like so many kind of like things that are stored in some ways. Um, I wanted to talk to you about where, because you, you leave a kind of ambiguity about where the world, where we are in the world. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if you could, I, I want to sort of like figure out like how do you see, like where's, what's happened <laughs> to this place? The, um, there's this sort of technology, there's, um, there's obviously this sort of lingering after effects of conflict, there's these um, environmental degradations where people have to go around um, and sort of pay this kind of constant carbon tax on on their behavior. Um, and then we have the specter of this sort of, you know, these soldiers, right, who actually come from the world of like reality TV and enter into the reality of the story. Um, how, uh, yeah, how the, how the kind of politics of this world are, are sort of kind of both off stage and yet at the same time terribly present. So I think, you know, going back, you mentioned the, so for one thing, there is a, a reality TV show about soldiers and uh, in that, in that way, you kind of just, and it's kind of just thinking about kind of this escalation of a kind of militarization, but also thinking about how do we like consume, kind of consume images and how do we witness things? And what does that do? Like, you know, I think I was thinking of that idea of compassion from different lens. Like, what does it mean just to witness? Like, if you're watching a reality TV show that's taking place in like a war zone, does that make you, does that make you like more compassionate? Does it make you, what does it do to you? Um, and kind, kind of having that as a question. Um, when what does it do for the people inside the television too, or inside TV, like those the soldiers themselves? Um, and also thinking about like, so there's a, this also carbon score monitoring that's happening, kind of thinking about uh, how do we on an individual basis track things, but also this is a government system. So it also seems like a kind of surveillance thing, uh, structure. So then what does it, what, you know, is it, does it, does it, how much does it really matter? Uh, like this is really, the system really helping actually this monitoring, uh, is it just, it's just a sort of facade for actually just getting all our data. Um, so just kind of thinking about like how we try to maybe do kind of even band-aid efforts that are maybe have like ulterior motives. Um, and also just thinking about uh, how AI can be a kind of saturate our world. I used to, I worked in this place um, uh, and there's the one time, it's actually actually a scene in the book. There's a futurist that comes into the office that actually happened. Someone from the came in, the futurist and he, come, he came to the office and told us about the future and had like images of the future and told us what's going to happen. Um, and um, yeah, so this, this future also felt like it was a very specific future for a specific a specific part of the world. Um, and also um, this question of just like, uh, and he also said we will all be coding in the future to some extent. Uh, so this is a prediction from this futurist. Um, but yeah, so I think I was just kind of having, uh, trying to like, how do we, um, uh, how do we kind of how do we how do we navigate this world when there's so many things that feel like kind of out of our control and thinking of these kind of AI machinery, these things are collecting our data. Uh, and like what role do we have, especially this character is working in a workplace that might be seems kind of problematic. She doesn't get to see the full vision of the company. She's working on a small project that might have like significantly kind of horrific effects. But she doesn't know fully. And what do you do? What's like your kind of moral compass in these spaces? I think we're constantly kind of navigating what you do in these sort of structures when you're like, uh, like what kind of power do you have? What kind of control do you have? Yeah, yeah the, the, I mean, there's that sense of sort of deep fragmentation, right? Where it's like, it's hard, impossible to sort of know what she's actually doing is related to the sort of larger corporate structure. And and I love the, the, the sort of interesting idea about the way that the sort of carbon mining that the people are doing actually might not be doing anything other than giving government um, the ability to track everything you sort of yeah. do. And then you become just a reflection of your, these sort of commercial mm -hmm. choices that you do or don't make. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> But but it's not yeah. it, it, it. But yet I I would have never thought it to describe the story as dystopian. Yeah. Um. Probably because it actually just feels way too familiar. Like there's not there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's nothing. Yeah. Like there's no radical departure. Yeah. And in fact, actually, I mean, I was I was sort of the scary part was actually how close it, how much closer the book seemed to me now 
you know, six months after you first gave it to me. And I was like, fuck, like that, what, what just happened in this short amount of time, which also means that in like six months from now, how much even more, you know, and at what point in time does this begin to sort of look like the teacup, you know, in the story where we're like, oh, that was such a, you know, innocent way of seeing the world. Yeah, and they're like, this, this is sci-fi. You're like, what? That's <laughs> fiction. Things got much worse than she imagined. Yeah. Version. Um, I think should we open it up to um to to questions? Thank you. Can we have a big round of applause, please? Ooh. The questions in the room. I'll check Zoom. Can you keep thinking? <laughs> you just keep talking. We get, we get, there we go. There's always one person who just has to break the. Thank you for breaking whatever, the ice. <laughs> Hi. So one of the key drivers is clearly loss and, and sadness. Is there a reason you chose loss and sadness as opposed to something equally as impactful, say love or romance or, you know, that those other large emotions? Yeah, no, good question. Also, there is a lot of love, and uh, I feel like a lot of people in this book are very lovesick <laughs> people. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, loss and grief, in particularly, because I think in that way, um, the book itself is dealing with kind of just de death and thinking about kind of like, um, uh, in that sense, thinking of de death makes you kind of think of life, and also just makes kind of makes you just see the world in a very kind of strange kind of like. Um, decentered way because suddenly like reality like once someone close to you passes away suddenly you're just like oh it just it kind of breaks some third wall and you're just like oh this is this is wait the reality kind of looks strange now like reality does not look like what I thought it would be um so I think using I've used that sort of kind of this kind of entry point uh and also I think uh death can also just be very funny I think there's a lot of humor in the book too and I think um so even like the, there's, you know, I think the the humor of it, I think maybe let's like kind of the sadness kind of punch more deeply. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of also, yeah, there's also love. There's like people like, like falling, falling in love. Also like this loss of love, lovesick. Yeah, I think lovesick is probably a very good word in some ways. Thanks for the question. More in-person questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned a couple authors like Octavia Butler and Du Bois um, that you felt like somewhat in conversation with or that somehow sparked something here. I was just wondering if there are any contemporary authors that you feel like particularly like you're trying to achieve the same thing, maybe in, in totally different ways or like you kind of feel like or maybe that informed this book or just your writing in general. Uh, yeah, um, I think in some ways the book was also, you know, dealing with a lot of like thinking about workplaces too. And I think like work, like even like Miyako Kawakami's work, she also thinks about like kind of like women and thinking of like navigating a workplace and also kind of relationships and also kind of different kinds of like loneliness and isolation. Um, but also, uh, you know, um, I think specifically uh, this, the, the inner manuscript, um, I had read a story by Stephen Milhauser. It's called Dangerous Laughter. And it's about this collective that tries to create a laughing club. It kind of just like the other, like you really try to just push the extent of laughter and it gets kind of dangerous, like the title says. Um, and it and it goes into really unusual places, but he kind of takes this idea of laughter and kind of pushes it to like this, like uh, pushes like the human condition to this, like, really to a brink. Um, so in some ways that story itself kind of stuck to me, stuck with me too, in thinking about the inner manuscript and think, thinking about compassion, like how do you take compassion and kind of push it to some sort of extreme and kind of also kind of have the sort of collective in thinking about it, navigating it. Yeah, thanks. We had a, a question on Zoom that also asked about the inner manuscript. So Livia says, um, I have not yet read the book, so maybe this question is answered as we read it, but the manuscript that is translated, was it originally an actual manuscript? No, 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 no. It's, it's not an actual manuscript, uh, but people have asked me that, so that would have been interesting if I did take it to the manuscript and then just like translate it myself and then just try to record it. But yeah, this is like a, yeah, a self-created manuscript, but it does uh, refer to, it makes kind of references to kind of old ancient texts too in the book itself. So it is um, kind of, it, it, in itself, it is referring to like a far ancient past too. 
so yeah so but it so yeah but it's completely made up but yeah and Olivia also wanted to know both about this manuscript and also about your interest in AI or high technology more broadly, if you could speak more about the research aspect. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I also, you know, I also did work as a programmer too. So uh, kind of around a lot of this kind of, uh, kind of conversations. Um, there's a really good book by Melanie Mitchell called um, AI Human Intelligence. Um, and it's uh, it's both kind of very technical, but also very accessible too. Um, and I was also just reading a lot of books about thinking about, um, uh, thinking about uh, also there's another book by uh, Ruha, Ruha uh, Benjamin uh, talk called A Race After Technology. Um, and it also just kind of talks about kind of like the kind of the, the biases of of, tech, of of AI, but also like how it kind of amplifies certain things uh, of our own biases. And also just the, just the idea of the singularity, like, you know, there's a lot of conversations about like, you know, the like AI taking over and like ruling us all or like robots. So, um, you know, most of these books I were reading, uh, uh, they were often talking about, it's not necessarily the singularity to be afraid of, just more about how like people in power will use tech AI and how it's being kind of used in that way. Uh, so I was kind of interested um, in um, kind of taking this this kind of conversation in AI, about AI and maybe even the mashing it with something that that's, that almost seems unconnected because the the book the inner manuscript takes place in like another country and another time period, but it's in conversation with the, this future place in New York City. So it's taking like two two different temporal places, two different geographic locations, and kind of like mashing it together. And like that was a kind of I wanted to have that kind of like a kaleidoscopic effect. Like each narrative has to speak to the other narrative, and that was probably also a tricky part of the book too, making sure that each section was speaking to the, the other section, especially since they were so different in many ways. Uh, though they both deal with you know compassion, even television is a big thing, and like both of those. So there's a lot of things that are it's like echoing, but maybe not in very obvious ways sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. I turn back to the in-person audience. <laughs> That just reminded me quickly that what you were saying with um, that the the sort of difference between the seemingly AI world and the future world versus the sort of radical compassion that these uh, women are practicing in a different time in a different country, but also because, I mean, even like right now, right, the relationship between like AI and what is it, ethical utilitarianism, right, like that idea of AI having a sort of social discourse around it and coming up with this one, which is almost... Rad in radical opposition to the one you imagine, right? Like there's the the radical compassion that your characters evoke actually revolves putting themselves physically and emotionally and psychologically into others, whereas the one that we see AI or proponents of AI oftentimes espousing is the one where you actually divorce yourself entirely from your ethical decisions, and it's actually about like what's the mo. So yeah, I was wondering if that was in your. I think I was trying to think about also like the, the kind of the ethics around this. What is what does it mean? Like, um, um, yeah, because you know, uh, having an AI uh, being kind of educating, deciding, deciding things, it feels like in some ways some kind of unbiased entity. So, uh, kind of thinking about what is like you know, we're giving away this sort of moral compass to something else. Uh, so, kind of thinking about um, what where does that moral compass or where what is the ethics of sort of kind of like that line of compact, you know, thinking about like um, how we make decisions and how we are kind of navigating the world. So, oh, yes. So, in, in the inner manuscript, this idea of radical compassion means that they are kind of trying to like physically, in a very physically psychological way, to open themselves up to other people in a way that kind of, in some ways, kind of. Uh, uh, going beyond the ego, going beyond themselves, and going beyond thinking about their own personal lives, uh, personal lives, uh, and trying to think what is good for more people. Um, I think that kind of utilitarian view is also think it goes to AI because there's an there's a car accident with the two self-driving cars, and um, there's a sort of trolley car self-driving car problem about like uh, whose life is worth more and how do you make that kind of calculation when it comes to like human lives. And how is the AI making decisions uh, in deciding whose life is worth saving? Um, so yeah, this, that kind of utilitarian thing is also happening in the radical compassion and thinking like, you know, is the, you know, you're trying to save others, but at what cost too? Akil, maybe you could also talk about the research that you did for the environmental aspects of the books and specifically about the carbon, the discussion of carbon, because that also feels at once grounded in contemporary discussions that you know, governments and policymakers are having about carbon, but also possibly some hopeful steps forward into the future. 
Yeah, so I was kind of kind of interested in the kind of conversation we were having about like kind of thinking about what the individual can do versus kind of these government entities, and like um, you know you know we you know in the U.S. we are you know the recycling you know our own recycling we recycle something we have no idea if this is doing anything, and um, uh, this question of like what do we do on a personal level and kind of what um, uh, what actions can you take uh, and does that even does that does that have an effect. Um, so I kind of want to have those kind of conversations on like what what can the individual do versus kind of thinking of like government mandates and how kind of how what what does the government mandate do and um, 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 and and will that will that sort of kind of will that sort of change the the kernel the, the kind of like where the the world is heading? Uh, it seems like in like in the book it seems like there you know there are many people have different perspectives about this so it kind of kind of having those different conversations about like uh, um, how do we go about like even the choice of even having children when the planet it seems like it's going down going you know into this kind of apocalyptic space uh uh how do you like how do you think about the carbon footprint of a child having a child and just kind of having those decisions like uh, those kind of questions come up and thinking about um yeah and thinking about the possible of a future is there a future world and like what does it mean uh yeah, like kind of the future of humanity and that's thank you yes Hi, I'm not with your book, but um, one of the things that I've been concerned about listening to your discourse is this almost mysterious thing that you've given to AI. <laughs> I mean, it's this like there, there seems to be something that I'm missing. Um, you know, these sort of like it's it's like a general thing. Whereas, I mean, from what I know of AI, it's a very specific thing in every different field. And so these aren't, yes, there are these advertisers, et cetera, and things, et cetera, who use that to target particular mm -hmm. markets for whatever their purposes are. But I mean, you know, AI is, is very, very fragmented in that sort of sense. I mean, you seem to be suggesting that it's sort of like an umbrella, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which, is, which, is, which is not mm -hmm. you know, something that I <laughs> believe at all. Uh, so I don't know uh, why. Why is this? Is this something that you also perceive? Yeah, no, good question. Yeah, because in the book, you know, I talk about specifically as narrow AI. So narrow AI is having a very specific function in the world. So just like how it is in like our in our in like our in our in our in our state of our world right now. So it's doing a specific function. So it's being trained for a specific function. For example, like doing for identifying names for a resume. So in the world itself, there is a very like narrow AI. So the specific project of the of the AI coder is a kind of stranger project that's kind of moving into this idea of more of like super AI. So but the world itself is very much so of like a narrow AI world that's like our own that kind of has a very specific targeted function that's doing one task. So it's not necessary. So it's so it's having what would happen if you have kind of these narrow AIs and a kind of larger and something larger kind of controlling multiple narrow AIs, which we don't have in that sense, and having it a more on a kind of structural, maybe even a more governmental level that happening. So kind of just taking what well, extrapolating narrow AIs and just pulling it a little what we have now and just making it a little bit stranger, imagining what what, what could happen in some some sort of uh, in some sort of maybe some sort of possible world you know maybe in six months from now this is going to look really like this is going to look really kind of old and like you know something you know after chat gpt something larger has happened and this is kind of yeah relevant <laughs> we had a really specific question um on zoom from sherilyn who says uh, enthusiastically, the novel is so brimming with ideas and creativity, exclamation point. We just heard Akhil mention um, Octavia Butler's inspiration. I'm thinking also of Ishiguru's Clara and the Sun, with Clara being the AI creature who nevertheless became so human to readers, indeed felt compassionate and impacted the grief of other human characters. Uh, I'm sure many people ask Akhil about this book, but do you have thoughts on it? Of Clarence, yeah, I think you know, uh, you know, we were talking now about narrow, narrow AIs, and then I think having this kind of humanoid, it's kind of like this, like neck that feels like a, a much further leap. So this is like, that feels like a kind of farish future, having this kind of humanoid that has a um, that is both kind of that has human feelings and kind of navigate them, navigate the world. Um, I also really enjoyed it. Um, and I think that book is also kind of dealing with uh, what you know, what is that kind of border between human and machinery, and what does that mean to even um, uh, 
also dealing with memory and loss, uh, thinking about what does it mean to preserve someone. And like in that book, there's this char you know, character that might be, um, this kind of uh, um, family's afraid of losing her. How do you preserve someone's memory? And can like a, can a humanoid, can some sort of structure uh, preserve that? There's also this book, a sci-fi book called After Yang, a uh, short story that also deals with kind of humanoids and also can kind of preserving memory. Uh, having this kind of humanoid just preserve someone's memory. Um, so I think a lot of these books are also just dealing in some ways with death and like how do we preserve something or like loss? How do we uh, preserve someone that we care about? Um, what does it mean uh, to like kind of let go of let go of all these things too? Thank you. We have time for one more question if there is one. Yes. Thank you. This is kind of a practical question. Uh, I think you mentioned that you work as a programmer as well. This was this was in the, in the past, but yeah, I yeah, see. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I was wondering how how long did the uh, writing process take you and your research? Uh, if you can talk about the the actual writing yeah. of the book, the process. Of yeah, that'd be that'd be good because I was talking about the how the translator is talking about her own process. Um, but yeah, this for the book, um, it's hard to kind of quantify a time. I was writing it too when like I, I did like a lot of writing actually when I was at Bard when I was there uh last year too um so it's hard to say exactly how long it took from the specific time of writing it so maybe like maybe three years uh, possibly um uh, but yeah the process of the book was very unusual i first wrote the inner manuscript the translated manuscript not knowing it was a translation and then um i ended up going to a lot of different archives. I was at the Jazz Archives at Rutgers University. And then later I went to uh, at the Schomburg Center uh, for the research of black culture. I was a fellow there. And then I was also going to a lot of film classes. So I think uh, I watched this one film by Agnes Verda called uh, Vagabond. And, um, and after watching that film, um, I um, in, uh, in that film, the, the, the director slash Agnes also um, seeing someone who had just uh, seeing a young woman had just suddenly died and she's trying to imagine why kind of like what has happened to this woman and there's such sort of kind of like love in trying to imagine this character and seeing why she has died and kind of trying to resurrect her so I think after watching that movie too and also dealing with all these archives I kind of kind of was thinking about uh translation in some ways and thinking about how I could uh, how, how I could have it um, use translation as a way to kind of resurrect the past resurrect people and that gaze that kind of loving and very intimate gaze of like being of trying to trying to resurrect someone's words trying to bring them back to life and how do I kind of like imitate that or kind of channel that in some ways um, so it was, it was this book kind of led me a kind of unusual journey and also during COVID I moved back home to New Jersey and I was spending a lot of time with my mom and she's also she's a code she also codes and she had just gone to some AI conference which was not related to her work at all um, but um, she ended up she read the manuscript too and started kind of like, like kind of like giving me feedback which was unusual like and like I did not expect this. This is like one of those COVID random stories that happened. Um, so I think COVID definitely influenced the book a lot. Um, even the questions COVID brought up, thinking about how do we even care for others and what does it mean um, when our lives feel very like intricately linked in some ways, but also kind of this distance we have. Um, yeah, so very, it felt like just really kind of uh, unexpected turns. 